Next, I'd like to discuss the role of the lumbrical muscle in the work of flexion of a repaired flexor tendon. I have not found this discussed anywhere in the literature, but having done work on the lumbrical muscle to better understand it, I would like to suggest that this is a factor that we should not ignore. Just a refresher that finger extension actively combines both extrinsic and intrinsic muscle power. The extensor digitorum communis works in concert with both the interosseous and the lumbrical muscles. Flexion, however, is primarily extrinsic, but it is mediated or controlled by the intrinsic tension. This means that if the intrinsic muscles, the interosseous and the lumbrical muscles are each tight, that that can restrict finger flexion. We will discuss that momentarily. Langemeier in 49 told us that the effect of the contraction of the flexor digitorum profundus is to a large extent determined by the arrangement of tendinous elements in the dorsal aponeurosis. In other words, finger flexion is to some extent controlled by the dorsal structures, one of which is the lumbrical. Now the lumbrical is a very complex muscle, illustrated here in the schematic drawing by the green. This is the lumbrical muscle and this is its insertion into the dorsal apparatus, moving through the lateral band and inserting into the base of the distal phalanx dorsally, which is called the terminal tendon insertion. During finger extension, the lumbrical muscle contracts, as seen here. When this muscle contracts and shortens, it pulls the profundus to which it is attached distally. It pulls it distally until it meets the resistance of the resting flexor muscle, and then the lumbrical is stabilized, and as it continues to contract, it then extends a finger. But the thing that is relevant to our discussion about flexor tendons is that during finger extension, the lumbrical is pulling the flexor digitorum profundus distally because it is attached to the profundus at its origin. So the profundus is being pulled distally and that distal pull creates slack in the tendon and what that then does is it diminishes the resistance to finger extension. This is actually magical. The lumbrical decreases the resistance to its own work. In other words, if you contract the lumbrical, you are contributing to the ability to extend the interphalangeal joints because you're decreasing the flexor resistance or force. This means that if there is an injury and a repair distal to the origin of the lumbrical, that during finger extension, the tension on that repair side is protected because the lumbrical is reducing it. Therefore, active finger extension should be something that we consider as being relatively safe for a zone 2 injury. So the relevant knowledge is to understand when the lumbrical will reduce load on the repair. Does it reduce it in all zones? No. In zone 4 and 5, contraction of the lumbrical muscle would pull the FDP distally and therefore that would actually increase tension. We don't really know the answer to zone 3 because we don't know where the tendon is lacerated relative to this origin, nor do we know whether or not the surgeon actually resected some of the lumbrical muscle. But if the laceration is in zone 1 or 2, 
We do know that active finger extension will decrease the tension on the repaired flexor digitorum profundus by virtue of pulling the lumbrical origin distally. So our conclusions are that an intact lumbrical muscle decreases load on a repair in zones 1 and 2 and perhaps zones 3 during finger extension. Having considered the lumbrical, let's talk about the role of the interosseous muscles on influencing the work of flexion. Here on your left, you see a schematic drawing of the interosseous muscle contracting. As we know, when a muscle contracts, that's in its shortest length. Now imagine that that is exactly the posture you've placed the patient in, in the orthosis. Unfortunately, prolonged positioning in this posture will contribute to the shortest length, or adaptive shortening of the interosseous muscles. The longest length is the exact opposite posture. It's extension or hyperextension of the MP joint with interphalangeal joint flexion. Therefore, during the postoperative period, it's impossible for the interosseous muscle to get in this elongated position. And it is very common that interosseous muscle adaptive shortening occurs postoperatively when there is full-time use of the orthosis. The interosseous muscles are very short fibered muscles. They don't have a lot of elasticity, so they're prone to adaptive shortening. They live in a fascial compartment between the bones with fascia dorsally and volarly and this contained compartment does not tolerate edema very well. Therefore, the pressure from the edema decreases the ability of the muscle to move and adaptive shortening is more easily occurring. During finger flexion, the interosseous muscles are elongated, but postoperatively, if finger flexion is limited, that means that the interosseous muscles are never elongated. And the edema within the hand, if it is prolonged, will contribute to the limited use of the muscles as well as pressure in the compartment. And now there's a vicious cycle, all of which contributes to adaptive shortening of the interosseous muscles. This is extremely common in postoperative patients who've had a flexor tendon repair. Climb and Associates tell us that it only takes nine days for our motor cortex representation to greatly diminish when our hand is immobilized, or in this case, I should say, when the pattern of motion has changed. So what are the conclusions of the influence of the interossea and work of flexion? MP joint flexion creates interosseous muscle tightness. It's created because of the prolonged position and the inability to get in a posture to elongate the interosseous muscles. Additionally, in this posture, the patient learns to initiate flexion with the MP joint instead of the extrinsic muscles and learns a different pattern of motion that does not facilitate glide of the extrinsic flexors. Mm -hmm.